It's the evening of July 13th, 1793, in Paris, France. A man is at his home soaking in his tub when he notices a young woman standing quietly in the doorway. She's petite, around five feet tall, with a calm demeanor, gentle features, and wavy auburn hair cascading past her shoulders. Ignoring his wife's wishes, he invites the stranger in. Their meeting doesn't last long, only around 15 minutes. Then, as the man utters his parting words, the woman reaches into her dress, pulls out a six-inch kitchen knife, and drives it into his chest. This is The Death of Marat by Jacques-Louis David. It might seem just like another drone, desaturated, old painting of some guy who really has it bad. But honestly, why waste your time on a painting like this, right? Wrong. This is an absolutely iconic painting, not to mention a masterclass in manipulation. Let me put you on. This painting was the artist's way of honoring his friend, Jean-Paul Marat, a revolutionary journalist and political firebrand. Jacques-Louis David turned Marat into an icon, immortalizing him as a martyr and in the process, created one of the most recognizable images of the revolution and arguably his most famous masterpiece. We're placed at the scene of the crime. A soft light streams in from the left of the painting, illuminating Marat's lifeless body slumped over the bathtub. His head, supported by a piece of furniture behind the tub, tilts in our direction. His contorted face reveals a quiet, listless pain as he surrenders to his fate. Marat suffered from a debilitating skin condition that left his body covered in itchy, inflamed sores. To ease his pain, he would spend hours soaking in a medicinal bath filled with foul-smelling minerals. He was also known to wrap a vinegar-soaked cloth around his head. Marat's right arm hangs limply over the edge of the tub, his hand pressing against the floor. A quill rests between his fingers, its tip bent under the weight of his lifeless hand. This is moments after the attack, and Marat is hovering between life and death. Although his assassin is nowhere to be found, her presence haunts the scene and the evidence she left behind. On the floor to the left of the painting lies the bloody knife used to stab Marat in the chest. The wound just below his collarbone is still open and bleeding, staining the white sheet draped over the tub and tinting the bathwater a brick red. A board draped in a green cloth rests on top of the tub and functions as Marat's makeshift desk. Since he spent hours at a time confined to his tub, he would often bring his work with him. His left forearm lies on top of the board and he holds a letter written by his assassin. It reads, July 13th, 1793, Marie-Anne Charlotte Corday to Citizen Marat. Because I am unhappy, I have the right to call on your goodwill. And below the writing, we can see the letter is stamped with a bloody fingerprint. This clue identifies the killer's name as Charlotte Corday. Beside the tub is a simple wooden box with a second quill, an inkwell, and another letter placed on top of it. This one, signed by Marat, allocates funds to a widow whose husband died fighting for the fatherland, leaving behind five children. On the front of the box, David inscribed A Marat to Marat and signed his name below. But who was Marat, really? What was his workout regimen? And how did he end up here? To get to the bottom of this, we have to rewind a few years to the beginning of the French Revolution in 1789. When France was in a pickle, the poor and middle class bore the brunt of the taxes, yet held almost no power in society, while the rich enjoyed privilege and paid next to nothing. Meanwhile, the monarchy kept spending until they were effectively broke. To make matters worse, poor harvests led to soaring bread prices and widespread food shortages. 
changes. As desperation set in, it became clear that the monarchy was completely out of touch. King Louis XVI was seen as weak and ineffective, while Queen Marie Antoinette became the symbol of royal excess, and neither looked like they were missing any meals which made everybody really mad. France's financial situation had gotten so bad that for the first time in over a century, King Louis XVI called the Estates General, a legislative body representing the three social classes of France, together to address the situation. The Estates General was divided into three groups. The first estate, the clergy. The second estate, the nobility. And the third estate, the common people, which included peasants, workers, and the emerging middle class. Despite representing the majority of the population, the third estate quickly realized that they would always be outvoted by the other two estates. Frustrated by this imbalance, they demanded a new voting system that more fairly reflected the needs of the people, which the king's officials responded to by locking them out of their meeting hall. Undeterred, the third estate gathered at a nearby tennis court, where they declared themselves the National Assembly and took the historic tennis court oath. This is generally seen as the start of the French Revolution. While many of his peers fled France during this turbulent time, David stayed behind. He understood he was living through history and wanted to be the one to document it through his art. David was always a bit of a contrarian. Growing up, his mother and uncles wanted him to be an architect, but he wanted to be an artist. His first art instructor taught him in the Rococo style, which he rejected for the more serious neoclassical style. When David's next instructor suggested he hold off on applying for the prestigious Prix de Rome scholarship, a French government award that sent young artists to study in Rome, he ignored him too. His teacher thought he was too young and inexperienced but David applied anyway, and he was rejected. So he applied again, and he was rejected again. At this point, David was convinced that the judges were conspiring against him. In defiance, he went on a nearly three-day-long hunger strike. He did eventually win the following year with this painting, but this didn't erase the searing hatred he had for the art establishment, nor did it heal his deep-seated distrust of authority, shaping what just might be his villain origin story. Early in the revolution, David joined the Jacobins, an anti-royalist group that fiercely supported the revolution and was willing to resort to violence to achieve its goals. David became a dedicated member, even creating propaganda paintings on their behalf. He also proudly voted for the execution of King Louis XVI, which was a big reason his wife, proudly divorced him, but they did eventually get back together. And after the fall of Jacobin leader Maximilien Robespierre, David was arrested for his ties to the group. It's likely that Jacques-Louis David met Marat early on in the revolution, and they became good friends. Marat, a physician-turned-journalist, was one of the most influential and radical figures in revolutionary France. Through his newspaper, The People's Friend, he passionately championed the revolution, calling for drastic action to overthrow the old regime. He was so hardcore that it's believed he may have contracted his severe skin condition from the time he spent hiding from his political enemies in the cellars and sewers of Paris. Marat's writings were steeped in fiery rhetoric, railing against the enemies of liberty and the evils afflicting our fatherland. He had a lot of pull with the public, especially the poor, and he used his influence to stoke fear and paranoia and promote chaos and violence. Although Marat didn't personally commit acts of violence, his relentless attacks on political opponents and demands for their elimination often led to their well, elimination. An infamous example of this was the September massacres in 1792. At the time, fear was rampant and rumors swirled that Prussian and royalist armies were advancing on Paris and that prisoners might be freed to aid them. In his newspaper, Marat fanned the flames, calling for a new bloodletting and urging good patriots to storm the prisons and run a sword through them. The result was a five-day bloodbath during in which over a thousand prisoners were brutally killed. So that was intense. Here's a little kitty break to cleanse your brain. Charlotte Corday was a 24-year-old woman from Normandy. She despised Marat because she saw him as the chief instigator of the revolutionary violence and political turmoil sweeping the nation. In her mind, 
Eliminating him would stop the bloodshed, weaken the Jacobins' power, and save France. On top of that, Corday blamed Marat for the death of her friend, so this was all pretty personal for her. Initially, Corday wanted to make a bold statement by assassinating Marat in front of the National Convention, but when she arrived in Paris, she learned that he had recently stopped attending meetings due to a flare-up of his skin condition, so she had to devise a new plan to gain entry into his home without seeming sketchy. To do this, Corday created a list of Girondin sympathizers from her region and claimed she needed to deliver it to Marat personally. The Girondins were a more moderate faction that, like the Jacobins, sought to establish a republic. However, they opposed the Jacobins' reliance on violence to achieve their goals, which put the two groups at odds. To Marat, anyone who didn't fully align with his vision was an enemy of the revolution and he viewed the Girondins as traitors of the cause. What Marat didn't realize when he invited Corday into his home that fateful day was that she was actually a Girondin sympathizer who hated his guts. Charlotte Corday arrived at Marat's home around noon on July 13, 1793. Initially, his wife, Simone, was suspicious of the stranger and turned her away. But when she returned later that evening, Marat overheard the commotion and instructed Simone to let her in. Once in his bathing chambers, Corday handed Marat the list of alleged enemies from her region. Marat carefully noted the names and reportedly said, their heads will fall within a fortnight. Then, without hesitation, Corday reached into her dress, drew the concealed kitchen knife, and drove it into his chest, severing an artery just below his collarbone. Marat managed to cry out, help me, my dear friend, to his wife, but by the time help arrived, it was already too late. Charlotte Corday didn't even try to run, and she was seized immediately and arrested on the spot. Marat's death was devastating for David, who arrived at the crime scene shortly after the murder. He immediately began sketching the scene in real time, using first-hand observations and police reports to capture every detail. The artist even organized the late journalist's funeral. The National Convention wasted no time commissioning David to immortalize Marat and paint, not just to honor him, but to turn his death into a powerful piece of propaganda. And David delivered. He made not only a gorgeous painting, but also a masterclass in persuasion. The beauty of the death of Marat lies in its simplicity. There are no opulent details, no signs of wealth or privilege. Marat is draped in plain linens with a blank wall as his backdrop. His desk is a wooden box. David wanted Marat to appear as a man of the people, humble, hardworking, and selfless, tirelessly laboring for the greater good. And despite its simplicity, the attention to detail in this piece is incredible and ensures we know exactly what went down here. Or do we? In reality, there's no evidence Charlotte Corday ever wrote this letter, or that this letter ever existed either. And the list of names Corday gave to Marat is missing completely. In fact, we know with certainty that Marat wasn't allocating funds to a widow or whatever, because there's physical evidence he was working on his newspaper when his killer interrupted him that evening. The evidence, blood stained and all, was saved by Marat's sister and preserved all of these years. These pages became the subject of recent DNA analysis in an effort to uncover more about Marat's illness. Researchers now believe that he was infected with a fungus known as Malassezia restricta, although the findings can't really be certain because the pages could have been contaminated as they are over 200 years old. But what is clear, though, is that Marat was very sick toward the end of his life, so much so that it could have even influenced his judgment and ultimately his impact on history. Due to the extreme nature of his fungal infection, Marat would have been covered in blisters and oozing sores. But David portrays his skin as flawless and smooth. Even in his slumped, almost dead state, he's kind of a hottie. Unlike this this version of the event, David even omits the murderer Charlotte Corday, because this painting 
isn't about her. It's all about him. Marat is depicted as a saintly figure, lying peacefully in his final moments. Many art historians draw parallels between this portrayal and other depictions of Christ. This was definitely deliberate on David's part, elevating Marat to a quasi-religious status, a savior of the revolution. David completed this piece in 1793, but it's dated year two, a nod to the secular ideals of the revolution. By using the revolutionary calendar, and rejecting the traditional Christian dating system, David reinforced his allegiance to the New Republic and its vision for a transformed society. At her trial, Charlotte Corday justified her murderous ways, saying, I have killed one man to save a hundred thousand. Her final wish was to have her likeness captured before her death, and this portrait was completed just hours before her execution. As it turns out, Corday's assassination of Marat didn't weaken the Jacobins' power. If anything, it strengthened it. In the wake of his death, the revolution descended into its bloodiest phase yet, the Reign of Terror, a period that sought to purge France of so-called enemies of the revolution through brutal repression, mass arrests, and widespread executions. In total, hundreds of thousands were detained and tens of thousands were killed. Initially, the public thought positively of David's painting, but it didn't take long after Marat's death for public perception to sour. The atrocities of the Reign of Terror cast him as a bloodthirsty demagogue rather than a revolutionary hero. By 1796, sentiments had turned so sharply that the French portrait painter Joseph Bose described Marat as short in stature, deformed in person, and hideous in face. Once David was released from jail, he became first painter to Napoleon Bonaparte, who would go on to become Emperor of France. Many have raised doubts about David's motives, questioning how he could oppose the monarchy so strongly, only to later endorse someone like Napoleon, who forcefully rose to power and made himself a tyrannical dictator. Though his revolutionary paintings were so raw and intense, which makes it difficult to believe that he didn't genuinely believe it. Wait. What is she? You know what? Never mind. After Napoleon's fall from power, David exiled himself to Belgium. To prevent the death of Marat from being destroyed, he brought the painting with him and hid it away. Following the artist's death, his family tried to sell the piece, but there were no takers. It wasn't until the mid-19th century that attitudes began to shift once more. When French poet and art critic Charles Baudelaire encountered the painting at a modest exhibition of David's works in 1846, he wrote, There is something at once both tender and poignant about this work, in the icy air of that room, on those chilly walls, about that cold and funereal bath, hovers a soul. This painting was a gift to a weeping country, and there is nothing dangerous about our tears. Does a soul truly hover above that cold funereal bath? I don't know. But I do know that in Marat's final moments, as his life was flashing before his eyes, he must have thought, F I really should have listened to my wife.